So, not going to spend a lot of time on me, but trust me that I've worked with GraphQL for a couple years in production, lots of users. Uh, this is not just like a side project where I'm talking about something that I don't know if it's going to work or not. This is absolutely going to work uh, in your day jobs. Um, I also am going to assume that you don't know a whole lot about GraphQL, otherwise you probably wouldn't have picked this talk. So I'm going to start in the basics. What is it? Why would you use it? And then I'm going to go and um, time permitting, I'm going to live, live code uh, how this would actually be implemented in React and Node and we'll see how far we get before I run out of time. So uh, the first question you should ask is like, oh God, why? <laughs> like, why? if it wasn't REST, fine. It's a lot better than SOAP, so can we just stick with that? Um, it's really like a lot better. I was pretty skeptical myself. Um, but two things really stand out right away, which is your development can really be sped up quite a lot um, in, in both uh, the client side and the server side with GraphQL. And the key selling point for GraphQL sort of initially is reduced web and mobile latency with requests. And um, I'm going to go into both of these, but like this, it's not just marketing. It definitely does really work out like this. Ever since we adopted our first service in GraphQL, we've never implemented another REST service again. And more likely, we've converted existing REST services to GraphQL even when there's just no business value at all. It's just you want to do it. And that's coming from me uh, as someone who's got a lot of stuff to get done, like it's worth using. So why does it speed up development? On the client side, it's great because uh, once you define what your GraphQL kind of schema looks like, and I'll go into what that word means, is they have fantastic tools for prototyping um, UI changes. And so if you can get your teams to agree on what your API will look like, uh, you can build out um, basically a whole UI uh, before the server team starts to implement anything at all. In fact, um, if you look at uh, GraphQL Summit last year, the guy from Airbnb gave a presentation where he basically redesigned one of the client sites for, uh, for Airbnb just on the fly, and he did no server implementation at all. He just spec'd it all out, and he could get going right away on the client, which is pretty cool. Um, you can do it with REST too, but it's just, it's just really nice uh, with GraphQL because of the typing. Uh, on the server, it's nice because um, you don't have the problem uh, if you've ever built like a high traffic site, you end up wanting to optimize the data that gets fetched for like a single page, right? So this is a really common pattern is you build something that's like very REST purist, and then you end up realizing that like your highest traffic page generates something like 15 get requests to fetch everything in like the most pure form, and then you end up building um, some, let's say, custom endpoint that's got just the right data for that page so that it loads really quickly. And the nice thing about GraphQL is that you basically never have to do that again. You just define your data and the page fetches whatever it wants to fetch. And in fact, it's even better than that because as you navigate to other pages, if you have a single page app, the client can be smart enough to just kind of fetch what's missing and fill in the gaps. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and there's just fantastic frameworks for implementing, especially on Node, which is only thing I'm going to focus on today. So yeah, I kind of like, these are related here, right? Uh, reduced web mobile latency. The win is just what I described. Um, so instead of REST where you're fetching, say, many, many, many requests to get the data you want, uh, you can fetch exactly what you need. You just tell the server this is the, what I'm looking for, and it comes back, and so you can avoid multiple requests. But on the server side, it's nice too because even if you were to have like a one REST endpoint uh, that's got, let's say, five or six attributes inside of its object, maybe one of those attributes is really expensive to compute. But in a typical REST request, you wouldn't be able to tell the server, like, I don't care about that attribute. Like, it's expensive, but just don't bother telling me about it. And so with GraphQL, the structure of the implementation is such that the server just never computes that expensive value if the client doesn't request it. 
And it's not like that's like some optimization trick. It's just something that naturally happens, just like you want it to when you implement GraphQL endpoints. I think that's pretty cool, where like the natural thing is also the optimal thing. All right, so just to recap a little bit where we're at, the obvious differences between the two. Uh, REST, you typically have many different URL endpoints for each of your data types and maybe like get, post, puts, and all sorts of URLs. Um, and then the URL is what signifies what's gonna come back to the client. And likewise, the response body is basically fixed for each of those particular URLs. And GraphQL is the opposite. It's almost like a trend back towards SOAP where you have a single URL, you make a request for some specific set of data, and the response that comes back is dependent on the requests that you sent in. All right, so I'm gonna go, there's a couple terms here I wanna walk through, and um, they kinda will make sense once we've seen them all, but I can't see them all at once, so the first thing we're gonna do is a query. So this would be like the term, the, the official GraphQL query is the request that the client would send to the server and to specify what it wants. And so it typically would, uh, well it will always make either what's called, and this is confusing because inside of the query, there's actually two types of things, which is uh, another query and a mutation. So a query would be, I'm gonna just want read data and you can execute all of my queries in parallel or a mutation, which is I'm making a request but I wanna make a change on the server and that would execute just a single one at a time. So you've got query or mutation all being the thing that's getting sent over to the server. So what does that look like? You've got um, post to the, your GraphQL endpoint. You've got this query down here, brewery, get breweries. Uh, I like beer. And so um, what you're saying is you want a list of all the breweries and you want their name. And then the response that comes back is gonna say, okay, here's your data. Um, breweries is gonna match your, like, um, this thing. And then the name, you comes back, you get the name, my favorite two, the answer and triple crossing, uh, and no errors at the bottom there. All right, so the schema is the API contract between the client and the server. So this is where you, uh, you get to sign on the schema once, and then the client can implement its side and the server can implement its side and then everything will just work first try when you deploy it. So it's strictly typed in that all the attributes, there's no like any type, it's just strings, ints, numbers. We'll go through them later, but it's strictly typed. And that typing, like all typing, sorry I like types, is it facilitates good tools. Everything that we've come to like in TypeScript uh, now that it's slowly taking over. And so, the sample schema is, again, sticking with my theme here. So we have a brewery type, which in this case, the brewery just has a name. And um, then, if you remember back to the query, say I said everything is either a query or a mutation. And so in GraphQL, there's this concept which is a bit confusing when you first see it, down here at the bottom. So it's, they've got this kind of like root type, they call it, called query, and it says these are all my top level queries. So when the client is asking for something, it's always gonna sort of get into the type hierarchy through these top level queries. You can't ask for a brewery just like in isolation. You have to have a query that you're asking. So in this case I said I could either get a list of, and that's a weird, uh, that bracket is a syntax for list of breweries, or I could ask for a, a brewery by name, I think. Yeah, brewery by name. And then you can have an argument to your queries. And hopefully I'll be able to show some of this in code. All right, so we've got queries, we've got schemas, uh, and then when you are building your schema, obviously you're building it up from uh, the collection of types that are possible. So you can have complex types, like we saw with the brewery, and there's also a, um, you know, the native types are what they call scalar types, so like int, number. So let's just go through a couple of uh, things to see what's possible here. So we've got um, the brewery type, and I've expanded it out a bit. 
so you guys can see a little bit more of what's possible. I've bolded the types that I'm trying to focus on here. So if you'll notice, a lot of them end in an exclamation mark. This is a pretty cool feature for um, typing. It says it's, it's non-nullable, or you'll never get null back here. This is great for TypeScript or code generation because you're going to get, or we've done it to generate Swift code as well. Uh, you get like the non-nullable types in those languages, and so your code kind of naturally is type checked for you. So you have a brewery. All breweries have a name that makes some sense. All breweries have taps. I mean, if you don't have taps in your brewery, come on. Uh, and then you've got beers. Now, if you look at the syntax on this beer uh, list. You'll see it's got two exclamation marks, and so what this says is uh, there's a list of a list of beers, and that list will never be null. Inside the list, there's elements that are beers, and none of the elements will be null. So it's a non-nullable list with non-nullable elements. You can have uh, enum down here at the bottom uh, for types, uh, for, for just like you know typical like. IPA, sour, stout, whatever. This is nice. And then for the beer type, uh, there's one other thing I wanted to show. There's the floating version of just not an integer. And on the very bottom, I've got one that's not a uh, null. It's, it is nullable, the type of the beer. So you could say someone's trying something new, and this beer has a null type. Who knows what it is? All right. So uh, resolvers. So if we stick with where we're going here, we've got queries, which is what the client asks the server. We've got the schema, which is the API definition between the two. We've got a bunch of types we can use to build up our schema from. And then the server needs to implement uh, the API that's defined by the schema. So the resolver is not exactly a GraphQL concept, I don't think officially. But what happens is like every implementation of GraphQL basically needs to introduce the concept of a resolver, which is when the client has asked for something, how does the server compute it when it's needed? And so that's the term resolver is pretty consistently used across all the implementations I've seen. Uh, teach the server how to compute a, one of the values in there. So you could imagine for my brewery list, the question is how do you teach the server how to get a list of beers for a given brewery by name. Uh, it's an implementation detail, like I said. I'm going to show off Apollo uh, because Apollo is basically the seemingly the only player in the GraphQL space. I'm sure there's somebody that's going to dislike me saying that. But for Node and React, I mean, Apollo it just has an amazing amount of good tools. So the structure of the resolvers is the thing that allows this sort of what I would say optimal composition and computation. So the way that you teach Apollo how to resolve attributes is the same thing that empowers Apollo to only compute the ones that you've requested and to work sort of like most efficiently to get the data that the client is asking for. Uh, this is uh, by far my ugliest slide, um, uh, not including the code that I'll show later, but. This is, I understand this is tough to read, but I wanted to just call out a couple key points here. The resolvers are done as an array that, or as an object that matches the same structure as your query. So you can imagine that this is like the resolver list for a brewery. So you've got beer, or beers, which is your, um, the attribute that the client is requesting. Uh, resolvers can be asynchronous, because often you're fetching something from the database. You're always given, uh, in Apollo, the context that this query is executing. So in this case, I'm going to jump back, sorry. In this case, right, we're implementing the resolver for beers in the brewery type. And so when you implement your resolver, the first argument to your resolver is that context, that type object that you're coming from. So you're saying the parent of this resolver is the brewery that was currently like scoped when the query was executing. Then you have arguments, which is like if you provided a list of arguments to the, uh, in the query, you would be able to access those. So if I was saying, give me all the beers for a brewery, uh, but only stouts, I could filter by type here by looking at the arguments. And then the last argument is context, which is 
something like if you use Koa, it's like the middleware state. It's like the context of the GraphQL engine completely. And so if you wanted to like one time initialize your Dynamo database connection or your MySQL connection, you would build up a client, you could put that client on the context, and then every resolver would have access to that context without kind of like lots and lots of nesting scopes. It just, you can put it on and access it. So in this case, I'm gonna do an async lookup to my context.storage, that's, we'll pretend that's Dynamo. I look up the beers by my parents' ID, so it was like by the brewery ID, I say give me all your beers. Uh, and then I'm just, in this case, I'm just gonna pretend like they've filtered by type, there's an argument. I'm gonna filter the list back and I'm gonna return it. And the nice thing about this structure is that the Apollo engine is never gonna call this resolver unless the client has explicitly listed that beer list in its request. So even, this is not always going to fetch for every brewery, it's never gonna list the beers unless it's needed. So um, I'm pretty much on track here. Does anyone have any questions about just like the high level, how this works before I jump into showing an implementation of this in code? Good. Yep, so the question was, how would you do a, a nested resolvers for nested complex types? And I hope I can show that off in the code. I'll try to get there, okay? But the basic idea is that for each type, you're gonna have a, a object array of, or an object of resolvers by type, and it'll find the type to resolve and it'll look it up. So you always got type resolvers, type, resolvers, type resolvers. And if it's nested, the engine is smart enough to find the resolver by type and then like look down the tree. That probably makes no sense at all without seeing the code, but uh, it just kind of works. Okay, yes. So, um, <laughs> ignore the error. That's, oh, you don't see that. Yeah. That's weird. How do I end that? I just want to end the show. Okay, now ignore the error. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a first up, I'm gonna start with a express server. I'm gonna add GraphQL to it. Then I'm gonna start with a create React app and I'm gonna add queries to it for that server. So it's a kind of a multi-phase thing. Starting with Express, add GraphQL on the server, start with create React app, and then um, add GraphQL to that, and then we can go and go and go depending on how much time I have. Should be plenty of time. Okay, so this is an Express server. It's about as simple as I could make it. I'm not gonna go into all the details. I'm gonna assume that you are fairly familiar with Express. It's gonna start a server on um, port 4000. I'll just go ahead and start it. If I've got this all set up correctly, I have something that's gonna like auto reload as I add to it. Let me just, yeah, let me see my mistake. And I've kind of cheated because I didn't wanna have to like remember how to do this on the fly. So, um, the first thing I'm gonna do, which I've already done because I didn't trust the network, is I'm gonna yarn install Apollo Server Express. So Apollo, like I said, is just kind of dominating the node space for GraphQL, and they have a bunch of these Apollo Server splats. So if you like Koa better than Express, which I do, but I didn't think many people knew it, um, you can use Koa, or if you use serverless, which we do, you can have Lambdas, you can have, I'm sure they've got one for Google, Google Compute Cloud, there's a bunch of stuff uh, expressed for today. So, and then you want to, first thing you wanna do is import the GraphQL Apollo server and this little GQL tag, which I'll show you. So, let's go up here. This is gonna do nothing. 
So then next thing we're going to do is we're going to add in the type definitions and the resolvers for what um, our schema would be. So I'm going to copy these into my code, and then I'm going to walk through it with for you. OK, so we've got the first thing up is type defs, which is I don't quite understand why they didn't call schema. They didn't call this a schema because the spec is called a schema. But all the implementations call the content of your schema your type defs. So for me, I, I don't know how much you guys know these tags in JavaScript, but it's just tagged in a GQL tag, and it says some checking of the syntax for you. And I just have right now like as dumb of a GraphQL schema as I could come up with. I have a single root query, which is just high, takes no arguments. Uh, you fetch it, you get a string back. And then my resolvers for this query on the server are going to be when someone asks uh, for that. So this is, again, what I was trying to describe to you here is the type is query. If someone asks for the high attribute, it's going to look inside of the query type, it's going to find the high resolver, and then it's going to execute it. My previous resolver had like a bunch of arguments. This one has nothing because I don't need the parent type to do this. I don't need arguments. I don't need context. I just, I'm just going to return hello. Uh, and then the last bit is I'm just going to go in here. And then so I've got my Express server. Um, set up. I'm going to use cores just so I know it's going to need, be needed. And I'm going to add in my Apollo server. So I'm going to initialize it. I'm going to give the type defs and resolvers to the Apollo server. Say, here's my schema. Here's my resolvers. Go ahead and make me something that can serve requests. And then this apply middleware is a, uh, just a helper that says, Oh, if you have an Apollo, if you have an Express server, I can just go ahead and I can slam a bunch of routes in there for you, so that uh, everything is hooked up correctly, which is great. So uh, if everything, <laughs> this is the real test, right? If everything is working correctly, I should have just set up a GraphQL server. So let's see. All right, yeah, this is great. OK, that's, I'm sure it's a little hard to see, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. So GraphQL and Apollo, like I said, amazing stuff they're putting out. They have something called GraphQL Playground, which comes built into the server in dev mode. And what it lets you do, if you hit the endpoint, is you can just play with mutations in line, and it'll let you experiment with your server running before you have a front end. This is great for that dev time speed up I was talking about. The server team can really quickly iterate on, are my queries working correctly without a client that's actually making the requests? This is like a uh, built-in, oh, what's the tool that we used to use? Postman for Chrome, uh, right? So uh, in theory, I should be able to write a query and have it execute for me. So I'm just going to say, my query is high. And check this out. You got little code completion here to show me that I had this thing is going to return me a string. Great. So I've got a high query. And then if I click Run, it says hello. Pretty cool. If I say hello, Richmond, and I save, yeah, sure. There you go. So uh, that's pretty simple. So let's stop this. What we want to do now is we're going to build a quick React app that takes advantage of that. So um, I cheated. I have a series of commits that give me all of the stages I want. 
you'll just have to trust me that I didn't change a whole lot here. Uh, the code is basically the same. It's probably just a little bit nicely formatted. So I have now a app, TSX. So this is, if you're familiar with Create React App, I have the very you know, basic Create React App output here. I'll go ahead and start up my server, uh, again, in my service. So I'll do yarn start. And then I'm going to make a new terminal. And cd app, which is where my create React app is. I'm going to say yarn start here, too. Okay, like this is familiar with for people who've done React apps in the past. So now I have the server running with the playground, and you'll see I ran a, a hi query again. It gave me hello because I had reverted to my you know previous Git commits, and I have React app, but it doesn't do anything interesting. So I'm gonna follow the same pattern. I'm gonna cheat and look at my notes for um, the app. So the first thing I'm gonna do again, not trusting Wi-Fi. I've already done this. Um, you want to install a bunch of stuff from Apollo for the React side of things. So you've got Apollo React Hooks, which is new, and it's way better than their old version. The pre-Hooks integration was great at the time, until then you see what they could do with Hooks, and it's a lot better, so I'm not going to show you the bad stuff. Uh, you get the tag again, and Apollo Boost is, um, it's just a whole bunch of like extra stuff that helps simplify initialization. You basically, every time you want to start with Boost and then you use it for a while and you realize that it doesn't do something quite right, you go back to like doing it all by hand, but Boost is a great way to get started. So again, I'm going to import all of these libraries that I want. I'll put them in the top of my app. All right, and then unlike in the node uh, server side, what we did was we defined our schema and we defined our resolvers. On the client, what we want to do is we want to define the query that we're going to ultimately execute. And again, it, it's wrapped in this GQL tag to do some validation for me. So I got that. That's my high query. All right, and then this is where things get interesting. We're going to make a new uh, component. I just used a function component here. And this line there is use query. This is the React hook. And so what this is saying is I want to execute a query for this component. Here's the query I want. It just says, you know, what's the result of high? And the if you're familiar with like uh, use state, you get these results back where it's like the current state and a setter. So the the so the, the output of this use query hook is basically a three state object, which is is it loading or not? Was there an error or was there data? And there's more attributes on here, but these are the basic ones that you want to look at. And so you find yourself writing similar code to this, which is um, if there was an error, what do you do? Okay, this is the first thing to handle. Um, in this case, I'm just going to write error. Uh, that's fine. And if there was an error, there's no point in going on. Of course, in the reality, like you might have a page that could render, but it's missing some data. So maybe you don't just bail early on an error. Maybe you handle it gracefully. Then in the case of loading, I'm just going to say loading. This is where you would put a skeleton screen if you were really hip. Probably just a spinner because it's like way faster, uh, and then in the end, if you don't have an error and you don't have and you're not in the loading state, then you've got some data, and you can use it. So in this case, I'll just say, I'll show it. What's the result of high? And I'll wrap it up in a div here. Uh, this isn't being used yet, so I'm going to change my app to take advantage of this. And I'll show you one last bit. So I can wipe basically all of this. 
I don't want any of the React template, create React app anymore. All right, and so this is where Boost comes in. So this Apollo client is uh, the Boost version of Apollo client, which is like, you know, built in with a bunch of helpers. And the primary helper is that instead of the concept of Apollo has these like links that you chain together and they execute different phases of the execution. But Boost says, well, really, you have a URI and you just want to like make requests against that. Can we assume it's HTTP? Can we assume you want some level of caching and whatnot, right? So Boost just says, just give me the URI and I'll build you the set of links that you really want. Once you've used this for a while, you realize that you want to tweak like some retry link to make requests when they fail or if you have a network problem. But like for now, Apollo Boost, just building a URI, giving you a client is just fine. So I'm gonna build a client with my localhost URI. And then if you were following along when we built the last, the component, that body component, you see this use query, you were thinking, how the hell is that gonna work? Like, <laughs> What, where is it possibly getting the data to make that query from? It's based on the React contexts and Apollo Boost provides this Apollo provider. You give it a client and you say anything inside of this context can use the, use the client that you've set up. So I just changed my app instead of just doing the React template, I'm gonna make a provider, I'm gonna provide the client to it and then I'm gonna render my body inside of it. All right, another moment of truth. Oh, it worked, that's right. I just clicked save and it rendered. This is awesome. Literally the first time I've done this presentation like this and it worked, okay. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, so let me see if I can break it. Let's say I change my query to say like, hi. Yeah, there you go. It didn't, see, it, it just, the saying, I'm sure it gave me an error back. Why don't we just throw it in here? Let's see what it says. Do you like that? No, that's worse. Okay, well we're back here, back here. Okay. So we're back to high. Um, I think if I was to come over here to my browser, if, okay, if you can watch really fast, do you see in the top left corner, every once in a while, you see the loading page? <laughs> yeah? Okay. It's loading, and then it loads really quick. Um, hopefully your service is as fast as that in, in, your, in your life too. All right, so let's see, I've got, I think I'm on track for like 10 minutes left. All right, let's try to do something we're gonna go off script and we're gonna try to add some more complicated resolver. We'll try to match my brewery bit here. So I'm gonna switch over to my service and I'm gonna just throw in a new type here in type text called brewery. And I'm gonna say it's got a name, right? And I'll say breweries and it's a list of brewery non-nullable list, non-nullable elements, and I'm gonna implement a new resolver. Yeah, and it's just gonna return a list. One is gonna be the name, the answer, and another one is name, Okay, I typed that pretty fast without a lot of explanation, but hopefully you guys followed along because this kind of matches what I had done previously. I added the brewery type, I added an attribute inside of the brewery, I added a new root level query in order to get to, get to that type in the resolver chain. Um, it's gonna return an array. This is really more for the client to say, I promise nothing's gonna come back null. If you have a type like this and I threw in a null here, the server is actually gonna mark that as a failure to say like, hey, you promised no nulls and you returned a null. That's not possible. 
And then I just threw in a quick list of breweries. This obviously in the real world would come from a database, but in this case it's not going to. All right, so that I'm gonna click save. I'm gonna go over to my playground and just make sure that it's working. I think. Oh, let me refresh. Okay, so there you go. It already found that there was a brewery, new brewery attribute. And it's gonna complain if I execute this by itself, just brewery. Because the key here in, in uh, GraphQL is like it's only gonna compute the stuff that's needed. And if I just say, give me the list of breweries, it's saying, with no attributes? Okay, then there's none, right? Or there's an array of, of like two, but there's nothing in the array. It does, it's just not possible. So I have to ask some, for something. And in this case, I've really only got a name to ask for. So I'll ask for it, and there you go. Data, breweries. An array, name, the answer, and triple crossing. Okay, everyone with me so far? You can sort of see how you might stack resolvers on top of each other. If I had beer, then I would say, well, yeah. So actually, if you're very astute, you might notice that I never defined a attribute resolver for name, but I did request it in the client, right? And that's weird. What it does is it says, well, when I asked for the list of breweries, I sort of get, got back in a list of attributes, that, and it already included the name, and that name was requested by the client. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pass that back. However, if I had included something like other name, it will not include that in there. I'm clicking play, it doesn't add it. It just says, you asked for it, it's on the type, so I'll give it to you. It's, it was in the initial list, so I don't need to do any new computation. However, if I add a resolver for brewery name, and I'll say, I do this, you see, it just changed on the far right to always return the name hack. And that's just saying because, well, you just said, like, whenever anyone requests a brewery name, just return the name hack. And so I could do here, brewery, brewery.name, like that, which is what you would, a sane person would do. And it works again, yeah. And so GraphQL saw that you were implementing this. Apollo saw that you implement this like every single time, and so they just made that the default behavior. If you've got an attribute, just take the same name, so you don't have to do that. We'll leave it in. All right, so if I go over to the app, and I wanna take the same query, a list of breweries, uh, and oh yeah, inside of it, I'll say name. Check out what my app's doing. Mm, that's weird. Oh, because it's rendering high, which is probably undefined. Let's render what this looks like. Okay, it gave me this list back but that's pretty ugly. So let's do something that's more reasonable. We will do um, let's do a div. Div like this. And inside it we will take data breweries and we'll do a map. Why? Why is, why is it not like that? Oh, I'm missing the last parenthesis, this one. Yeah, I was off by one, right? 
No, that should work. No, that's, that, that should be fine. I think it's complaining because I don't have a type on it. I often have pretty strict type rules. Yeah. Oh, the whole wrapper dev. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, and like three, four minutes left in the presentation. All right, so uh, there you go. You could imagine that once you get this brewery back, you're actually gonna pass that to some other component and it could render its own data there. But um, I think hopefully I've covered enough to, so, to show you that GraphQL is cool and different and interesting compared to REST. It's possible to implement a server and a client very quickly, um, definitely in less than 45 minutes. And um, it's really a win for your development team. I'm a developer 90% of the day, and uh, I love using it. So 